So sometimes in life, ladies and gentlemen, people are told that they can't have something or they can't do something. And oftentimes that serves as motivation to want to prove those people wrong and to break through those barriers and to get it done. I mean, you think about Michael Jordan, one of the best basketball players in the history of the game, was told as an eighth grader, you're not good enough to make the team. Um, Steve Jobs, the basically the creator, the founder of Apple, or one of them, was told he was not creative enough and his ideas were not going to work. Uh, Oprah Winfrey was told that she was not, you know, people weren't going to listen to her. She was going to continue to live in poverty. And now she's one of the wealthiest people in the world. Okay? Um, you know, and the list goes on and on. Sonia Sotomayor, who's uh, a, a Hispanic individual who serves on our U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, she overcame adversity and was told that, um, you know, when she was growing up, they're not going to want many women on the Supreme Court. Uh, you need to have these big, hefty law degrees, and, and you're probably not going to get to that point. So my point in all this is um, these people worked and in many cases had to educate themselves and part of education is literacy. And so that's what we're gonna talk about because in the early 19th century, the 1800s, education was not available to everybody. It was essentially granted to you if you were a wealthy individual or if you were um, you know, a white male, okay, or all three. So when we talk about these reforms, the primary goal of education and literacy reform was to improve society through learned knowledge and wisdom using logical reasoning and moral training. So people wised up during the second great awakening and thought um, some of the problems that are existing in our world, it might be because people have not been educated on how to navigate through life. They haven't been, um, they haven't heard of these other instances and a good way to learn anything is to read it. And it doesn't necessarily mean reading in a book. It could be reading any sort of print to, to learn that knowledge. To gain that knowledge, I should say. So in the early 19th century, most education, like we said, took place in these cramped, small, one-room schoolhouses. Students who were able to get an education or to go to school were taught by poorly trained teachers. So these teachers did not really have to have a degree. They were not formally trained in how to teach, so their methods were not effective. And some of the things that they were teaching were not even accurate. Most education was in the North and it was private wealthy or wealthy private schools where if you had money and your parents thought that education was important for you, then they could send you to this school or they would hire a private tutor to come and teach you. So if you didn't have the money to pay a tutor or to pay a teacher, then education was something that you basically just got by going to church or what your, your family taught you. So one of the people who started this crusade for education reform was named Horace Mann. And he and others in the state of Massachusetts were working to try and bring education reform. And so he was later known as the father of public education because he led a successful campaign for pre free public education. He said, if we want our society to be better, we need to give people access to become knowledgeable. And um, the best way to do that is by making it free and making it mandatory. So the word compulsory here says that in the 19th century, they started to make laws state by state that said you have to go to school. And that still exists today, right? So the state of Michigan, the law is that you have to be in a some level of education, whether it's public school, private school, or whether it's officially sanctioned homeschool, okay? So homeschool doesn't mean that anybody can just teach whatever they want. They have to um, be officially recognized. There's forms that they have to fill out and things like that. So, um, but you have to basically be in education at least until the age of 16, I believe. And he also said that schools need money. They need resources. They need better books. They need bigger classrooms. They need um, teachers who are going to get paid to be trained and to you know, have some financial motivation to reach further and do more to teach their students better. So he said, why don't we have taxes, state taxes that are collected from every individual and that portion of that goes to education. And again, like many, they felt that better education would develop a more successful democratic society and therefore would lead to a stronger and uh, more reasonable government. Now, we talked about 
education mostly for white males. So I go back to the beginning of our lesson here and I talk about uh, when people are told that they can't do something, they will oftentimes work harder to break through those barriers. And so in the 19th century, we start to see these black literacy societies because the awful truth was that African Americans, whether they were enslaved or whether they were free, were not allowed to attend school. They had to basically create their own schools. And so they did. And so the primary goal of these black literacy, literacy societies was to enable empowerment for African Americans and other people of color and to gain advancement through their literary skills. So by becoming educated, more educated, I should say, by um, reading about law and reading about um, you know, social movements and things that would help them overcome racism and oppression, by having that knowledge to be able to prove that they were as capable educationally, if not more capable than some of their white counterparts. And so this was a huge movement and this was a, a great source of pride for African-American culture because again, these were set up on their own. It wasn't gifts handed to them. It wasn't something where the government said, all right, well, we're gonna do this for you. It was essentially started all on their own. So think about like, you, you hear these stories of companies where the, the owner starts it up from scratch and they basically do all the work on their own until they get big enough and, and wealthy enough to um, help expand and bring on more resources. So that's essentially what these African-American uh, black literary societies did. And, and that's a huge sense of pride huge sense of accomplishment. Now, these were mostly in the North because of the fact that there were a greater population of free Blacks in the North. In the South, unfortunately, the majority of African Americans were enslaved, and so therefore they had even stronger restrictions and even more limited ability to be able to do these things. In fact, it was to the point where um, reading and education was in some states seen as illegal, and, and they could face, um, you know, being arrested if they were caught even reading a book. I know that sounds like such a uh, an archaic concept and such a horrible thing, but that was the, the truth at the time. And so again, I think that speaks to even how, how much better it is to know that these societies were created and that they worked and it spread among um, the culture. And we see people like Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, who were some of the first African-American um, scholars, meaning like beyond just a, a high school education, beyond a college degree, they started some institutions of higher learning, okay, like Bethune-Cookman, um, Howard University, um, some of the uh, other schools once they started to get integrated in the South. So a lot of great accomplishments through literacy and being able to read and to speak and to um, put their minds and their voices in working for social justice. 